All right. Welcome to the Daily Objective. I am Don Watkins, Chief Intellectual Strategist for ARC UK. And uh, I am here. This is my first hosting uh, event for the group, but I'm here with Greg Salmieri, who most of you know is a philosopher. Greg, do you want to? I forget your exact uh, current title. So why don't you? Let yeah, I think know. the best one to use is, is Senior Scholar of Philosophy at the Salem Center, uh, which is uh, part of the University of Texas, Austin. So, um, uh, I, was it last week? Not, not too long ago, we um, did a debate. We hosted a debate between uh, Rucka and Mark Pellegrino, where they were arguing about what's worse, skepticism or religion. And um, one of our participants afterwards asked a question that I thought was interesting about the relationship between skepticism and agnosticism. And so I think agnosticism is an issue that comes up, I think, a lot for people who are interested in kind of the philosophic question of does God exist? And in particular, if they go the atheist route, they'll often run into people saying, how can you call yourself an atheist? How can you claim, how can you say God doesn't exist? Can you prove it? Isn't the, the right position to say, who knows? I don't know. Um, we got to leave the door open. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about that with you. And because um, often the debate of agnosticism versus atheism feels a little bit um, like people quibbling. But I do think that there's important philosophic issues buried underneath. And maybe I'll set up this way, which is I became an atheist at like 13. And I remember running into the issue of agnosticism. And my reaction was it was something like, ugh. It, there was something about it that just seemed repulsive to me or um, unserious, but I couldn't quite articulate what it was that um, rubbed me the wrong way about it. I have a better idea now, but why don't you, uh, what, what's kind of your global take on agnosticism and, and is there even a real issue here? Oh, I can't hear you. you oh, are, sorry. You sorry. Let you me go. maybe recount my own childhood story on this since you're starting with yourself at 13, I was, I don't remember when, but very early on, um, you know, like in very, very young, I thought religion was make-believe. And it wasn't such a big leap for me. My parents were sort of, I guess they might call themselves agnostic or spiritual. They'd say things like, well, you know, there's got to be something. But, um, you know, there is something, there's lots of things. Um, but they, uh, you know, didn't have any particular religious beliefs. My mother was from a Jewish family, my father from a Catholic family. So, and I wasn't raised in any particular religious tradition. I was told a bit about God, but not in any way where anyone had tremendous confidence about it. And it seemed very much like all the other make-believe kind of things I had, you know, television characters and, and so forth. Um, and so, you know, even before I was in elementary school, I regarded this as, as, as fiction. And I remember sometime when I was, you know, pretty young, like maybe fourth grade or fifth grade, um, talking to my father about it. I think it was my father, but it was somebody in my family. And he said, well, how could you say, you know, you know, there isn't a God, isn't, you know, how, isn't that arrogant to you? How would you know there isn't something? you? Um, and that I was introduced to the term agnostic as a term for like, well, you don't, you're not an atheist or an agnostic, if you don't think you know. And my view at the time was, and it, it's still sort of this, look, I don't know what word to use, call it agnostic, call it atheist, but it, it's not like, I don't know if there's a God, like some other question that might be an, an uh, open question for me that I'm pondering. I, I mean, God's like unicorns. I can't prove they don't exist. I can't prove the tooth fairy doesn't exist. I can't prove, if, if that's what you mean, like God's like those things. And if you want a word, um, and again, I, as an adult, I don't think we should have a word for this, but if you want a word that that captures the status, the, the view that one has properly towards those kinds of things, fairies, gremlins, unicorns, uh, the Loch Ness Monster, all kinds of other things that are make-believe that some people think are real and you recognize as having this same make-believe status, um, that God goes in that group. And if that's an agnostic, okay, if it's an atheist, okay, but it's not an agnostic because an agnostic is someone who really regards it as an open question, right? That's what we need a word for. There's no difference in the attitude of um, 
for all I can tell, this is make-believe. There's no more reason to believe in this than to believe in anything else that's made up at random at the moment than to believe that Harry Potter is real. The way you live your life, the way you function, the way you think, if you think that, is no different than if you think you can prove the thing doesn't exist. It's the thing is arbitrary, the thing is not worth thinking about, the thing is unfounded, the thing is baseless. And that's a very different place to be intellectually with something than to think, well, you know, gee, it's a, a real question whether this thing exists. Uh, I have to hold this open in my thinking. I have to make allowances for it. Maybe there are gremlins and so I shouldn't turn off the light. Maybe there is a God and so I should pray or, or um, you know, um, uh, take it into account in my uh, sex life or in my uh, plans about my career or um, in, you know, uh, whether I go in for jihad or whatever it might be. Um, that is just, you know, a very different mental state than, um, yeah, some people say this, but there's no reason to think it. And if that's the appropriate state to be in with respect to God, that is once you've looked at the evidence and arguments, then I think the right term for that state is atheism. It's the same state you have with respect to all these other, uh, other uh, cases of fiction. And to call yourself an agnostic is to want to say the jury's out on this, this is an open question for me. And that might be the right thing for some people to think if they're in the process of weighing through and thinking about the evidence of this thing and they're, they're, um, they're just not sure having really looked at it. But um, just saying you can't disprove it. We could talk about whether it's true that you can't disprove it, but you can't disprove it in the same way you can't disprove that Harry Potter really happened or that um, there were unicorns or whatever. That's, um, I don't think that's intellectually serious. Yeah, I mean, like, look, there's there's a ton of like open questions that we have in life, right? So, I mean, um, Matt Ridley uh, is just about to come out with a book on, you know, was COVID, did it come from a Chinese lab? And he doesn't reach a final conclusion, but he kind of, uh, uh, from what I understand, goes through the evidence. And so it's like the jury's out. We're kind of weighing things, going through them. And agnosticism, apart from the kind of person who maybe like they're just getting interested in philosophy or they're kind of reconsidering religion, setting that to the side, agnosticism is a final position. I think what I was reacting to when I was younger and the reason why it had kind of a yuck factor is there's a certain disingenuousness, right? Because it's, I'm leaving it open, but not in the way that I do. If it's the jury still out, I'm looking for evidence. Um, I, as you pointed out, weighing it in my decision making, it's just, that's kind of a final position that I'm not undergoing any new mental processing. Um, but I'm kind of refusing to take a stand and put it in the category of make believe. Yeah. And I would say there's even a third position, but so there are things that you're actively processing, you're thinking about, you have a, a considered opinion on. And the considered opinion, at least for the time being, is I can't tell. And I'm open, I'm looking for evidence on both sides. This is an active matter of thought for me. Whether, um, you know, maybe you're sitting on the, the, the a jury, maybe you're sitting on Kyle Rittenhouse's jury right now, right? And if you are sitting on that jury, you should go into the case saying, I don't know if this guy is guilty or not. There's been, there's going to be evidence presented to me on both sides and I'm going to sit here and listen to it. And at the end of the thing, I'll make up my mind. And if your mind's made up before you go in, you shouldn't be on the jury. It's fine if it is made up, but then, you know, you're, you're disqualified as a juror. Uh, and there are lots of cases like that where, you know, I don't know yet. I'm in the process of thinking it. There's the case where you have made up your mind. And there's a case where you don't care. Like there, there, are, there are a million questions to answer in your life. All of them, the answers could have some bearing in some you know, possibility of some action you could take, but you can't investigate all of them. And there's a category of, 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 of issues where you might think, look, I don't know. I can't come up with any decision I'd make differently if I knew one way or the other. And so I'm not even looking into it. You know, I don't have an opinion on who should win an election in Cameroon. Uh, I don't have an opinion on, um, you know, uh, whether, um, you know, well, for me, it's the JFK assassination. Okay. I, 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 that, you know, I have, uh, let's say people I know who are, 
um, they're not even that inclined to conspiracism, but like, no, there's all this evidence. And it's like, I'm not going to wade through that in the off chance that this is true. My life won't change at all, except for that. I now have a, a weird opinion that doesn't affect my life and wasted a lot of my time. Yeah. So I wouldn't say like you can become agnostic on the JFK thing if you start to think about it and think, yeah, the right thing to do is to suspend judgment on this or whatever. Uh, but if you just haven't read it and you haven't thought about it, like, yeah, reasonably, yes, yeah, some people think something on this. I don't know what it's all about. And I wouldn't even call that agnosticism. It's like, I'm not interested in this. You know, uh, I don't have any, any opinion on who was the best baseball player in history or whatever. It's not a field I know about or care about. Um, but agnosticism, I think of as a, I've taken a position on this. I've thought about it, worked it through, and my position is you can't know, or I can't know. Um, and, uh, or I can't know now, but I'm waiting to find out more. But typically people who do it in particular with God, it's not that they're waiting to find out more. They're, there's a kind of comfort in a happiness with the position of, I'm going to try to be on the fence about this. And you could imagine that you start reading a bunch of stuff about JFK and you read the evidence for this and the evidence for that. And maybe you're in a place where you can't make up your mind and you think, boy, this is more confusing than I thought. I went in thinking um, there was a second shooter, but then I read the debunkings of that and now I'm not sure. Whatever it might be um, where you find you can't make up your mind. But, and your, your judgment is, this is a hard nut to crack. I don't know what's true here. Or I don't know yet. But that's different from, I don't have an opinion. I haven't researched it. That's not agnostic. That's just, I don't know about that. I know some people think it, I don't know, right? But agnosticism, I think of as you're taking a position in the, in the debate and the position is there's a balance of evidence. It's hard to tell. This has to remain an open question. And so insofar as my life is going to be uh, influenced by this, by the answer to this, and so far as my decisions, I'm gonna have to make decisions. I'm gonna have to think about it in different ways. I'm going to um, make allowances for both options, right? I'm, um, you know, if I think the Christian God might be real, I'm going to try to avoid to do anything that, you know, would offend against him too much, but I'm not going to go the full nine. I, you know, it, it's strange though with Christianity because it's so, you really have to live your life so differently if you, if you think there's a God like that and you take it seriously. Yeah. Well, so, um, I mean, that, that's part of my question. Like if you left the door, like I'm trying to put myself in the space of, if I really genuinely was trying to like take an agnostic position and saying like, I'm leaving the door open. Maybe this is true. Like how, I don't even know what the action implication of that would be. Um, like what, you know, what follows from that? I mean, aside from bad thinking methods, but like in terms of, you know, you'd think if I thought, well, like maybe there's a real chance that there's a God, am I, you know, um, am I accepting Pascal's wager? Like, what is the, I, do you, I guess I don't know enough agnostics even to kind of reflect on what they um, take it to be, but that's why I say they, it usually doesn't have any real action implication, but I'm thinking of somebody who's genuinely trying to follow through with that position. Well, one thing that it could mean if you really took it seriously is I'm trying to find out what's true. And I, I spend a lot of time racking my head over, you know, is there a God or is there not? I, I'm an agnostic now, but I'm not going to remain that way. I'm going to settle this. Um, maybe I'll become a guy who inclines to thinking there isn't. Maybe I don't think I can prove it, but I'm not going to live as though there is one. Or I'm going to, um, you know, decide that there is, maybe not with certainty, but then I'll go and live as a, as a believer in whatever God uh, I think there is. There's a wonderful um, bit in the Julia Sweeney monologue, Letting Go of God, which I'm a, a big fan of, where um, she begins as a, in this monologue, she, it, it's a, her recounting, you know, somewhat dramatized versions of things happened in her life. And she begins as a Catholic and, and goes through a lot of different stages in her thinking and eventually uh, lets go of God, decides there isn't one, becomes an atheist. And um, it's reported in some newspaper, Julia Sweeney comes out of the closet as an atheist and uh, her parents flip out um, and they call her and they, you know, can't you say you're still looking, sweetie, they say. And her answer I think is really right, which is, well, I am still looking if that means you know, that we're always trying to understand the world better and open and sensitive to more evidence, but unimportant questions that determine the way you lead your life. 
um, yeah, you're always going to be open to evidence as it comes in for anything. But you have to say like, yeah, I've made up my mind. There's not evidence to believe in this. I'm not going to live as though I believe in this. And the way you live as though you, if you believe in it or take it seriously as an open question, and then you're trying to settle whether it's real for you is very different than the way you live if you don't. And if you're trying to sit on that fence, um, why? Why are you trying to sit on that fence? Because you're actively trying to solve the problem and you, this is what you're reading and this is what you're thinking about and this is what you're doing to work out this all important question of um, that determines you know, how you're gonna live your life or because you're afraid, you don't wanna take a stand, you don't wanna ruffle any feathers, you wanna somehow be acceptable to all sides, you wanna be a coward in the middle of the road. And I think very often agnosticism is about that. You don't wanna, you want to not take a stand and you imagine that this thing is a way to not take a stand. And I find that that's a common motivation. It's a common thing students do in papers, by the way, not just on God. If you wanna, um, you know, a typical thing that'll happen in, in a class is you'll present one side or the other side and most of the papers will always try to split the difference between the sides. And most people think they're moderate on most things because they can come up with someone who they think of is, you know, more to this side than them and someone who's more to that side of them. And, you know, you know, I'm a moderate, I'm between Stalin and Pol Pot, or I'm a moderate, I'm between, you know, Hitler and Stalin, or I'm between, you know, Biden and Donald Trump, or whoever it is, you, you pick two people who seem to you to be Poles, and you try to situate yourself in the middle of them. And it's a, it's a, uh, I don't think, there's a kind of intellectual cowardice, I think, in that. Yeah, and if not a cowardice, there's at least a kind of, um, I, I want to say laziness, but maybe that's not quite the way. But it, it, so often in issues is that both sides frame things wrong or take false alternatives. And it takes a lot of work to conceptualize, I think, the right way to think about it and sort of the default to say, well, you know, there's something uh, right, right on both sides. But usually what's, quote, right is them rejecting the other side, right? It's whatever yeah. they're pushing up against an error. And so one possible thing that a person might think is, well, look, you know, that uh, atheists are um, certain that there's not a God and the religious people are certain there is a God and the the problem is certainty. And there's a way in which um, I think of uh, skepticism as kind of universal agnosticism. I, I wouldn't, I haven't thought about that enough to uh, lay claim to that view, but what do you think about the relationship between agnosticism and skepticism? I mean, because there is a more nihilistic form of skepticism that really is more tearing things down um, versus just kind of a shrug of, I'm not going to commit myself to anything, which is, you know, seems more agnostic. Say something about what you said before first, though, because um, I think there's something right about it. And there's, in a, a case where there's really a yes, no question, is this statement true? Does this thing that some people think exists really exist, right? there's kind of no room in between. And th there is this kind of cowardice in something like the people who are trying to split the difference on the, uh, think they're the middle of the road between whatever two political factions there are in their country or whatever two movements, there, um, there often are many other alternatives besides what the two people presented to one as antagonists represent. And it's often right to say neither of them is right. And people often when they've had the sides presented to them as opposites, though really they're not opposites, uh, will often hold their rejection of both as thinking that I'm in between. And that isn't, it often is an issue of cowardice, but it, it very often is, and it very often is just confusion. In any case, it, it's wrong. And I think it's a, a real, when things are presented to you as opposites or as alternatives, a real kind of important thing to do intellectually, and it's a kind of superpower to be in the habit of doing it, is to think, why should I think these things are opposites? Does this really exhaust the range of views? Are these really you know, polarly different to one another? Or is it just, these are two uh, competing factions in the milieu in which I happen to be right now. And you know, there could be a third alternative to both of them that's, not, that's more different from both than either are from one another. And that you know, requires some creativity, some historical perspective often to see. But once you get into the habit of seeing that that kind of thing is true, and that's something a lot of us have learned to do from Ayn Rand. Um, it, it really is, is powerful and, and helps one avoid a lot of traps. 
Now, the you ask about skeptics and agnostics and um, I mean, agnosticism is generally used as a name for a view about God or religion, um, but you can be agnostic about anything, of course. And so how does it relate to skepticism? Well, skepticism too has, you know, different senses. Um, as a, a, there's the kind of skeptic magazine sense of skeptic, where I'm someone who questions the consensus. There are things a lot of people believe that I don't and, and so forth. And, and, you know, in some situations that can be a healthy or proper uh, perspective. Oh, I'm skeptical about your hypothesis. I'm a skeptic about um, climate change or about the policies that are promoted to deal with climate change or about masking or whatever. And each of these things you have to think about, you know, well, what is the case and is skepticism here justified or warranted uh, or not? But it, all it means is I doubt this, right? Or I think uh, people have accepted something a little too uncritically, it requires more thinking through. Uh, and, you know, sometimes that's the right position on something. Um, in philosophy, skepticism has two meanings, um, both of which I think are for bad types of positions. So one is the view that we can know nothing. There's nothing we can really know. Um, and uh, I think that view is false, and we can talk about why someone might think it, but um, it's well known to be self-defeating if you think you know that you know nothing and so forth. <laughs> Um, and it generally comes from accepting kind of arbitrary scenarios and thinking that you have to prove your way out of them to know anything. So I would have to know that I'm not a brain in a vat or deceived by an evil genius or whatever it is, or in the matrix, you know, to know that I have hands, but, uh, you know, I can't prove that. So I can't know that I have hands or whatever, that kind of, um, argument familiar to people from many philosophy 101 kind of classes. There's also the more in a way serious, but I think equally um, deadly and destructive view uh, uh, called skepticism that is closer to the kind of agnosticism that you talk about. Uh, or, and, and this is the view of, of the Pyrrhonists um, in ancient Greece and the kind of original skeptic school of thought. And their view was um, you should aspire to, or you, your aim should be suspension of judgment. They're part of a kind of tradition that happens in the Hellenistic period. This is the period uh, after Aristotle and, and it named, well, named, historically the period after Alexander's death, Alexander and Aristotle die around the same time um, and the kind of later stages of Greek society. And um, all of the philosophies that come about in this period, Epicureanism, Stoicism um, also have to do with kind of abandoning or giving up ambition in some way and seeking a kind of tranquility or just, you know, being cool with things. There's a, um, a book on Stoicism published now, kind of a modern revival of Stoicism book called, I think, The, the Subtle Art of Not Giving a, well, I, maybe I shouldn't complete the word, but, um, and I think that's a, a nice way of describing Stoicism, but also this whole kind of um, trend in philosophy at the time. And, Pyrrhonism, this kind of skepticism, and they call themselves skeptics uh, after Pyrrho is the progenitor of this school. Sextus Empiricus is another, the, the, the main guy we have writings from. Um, their view is you should, people try to defend their beliefs. They form a belief and they try to defend it. And then they're anxious, you know, when there's maybe counter evidence to it. And they're, they're, they're not happy in part because they're wedded to beliefs. They have these commitments to beliefs like a Buddhist or a Stoic might think people have too many commitments or attachments to external things in the world. People, the, the Pyrrhonists think, have too many commitments to ideas, to beliefs, to doctrines. And we should try to get rid of these. And so you should try to find arguments against anything you believe. And then if you start believing the opposite of it, you should try to find arguments against that. And always be working to try to maintain in yourself this kind of suspension of judgment. You're always looking but you're not looking because you're trying to ultimately find an answer and you just think we're not there yet. You're trying to preserve yourself in this state of, I don't know, there are reasons on this side and reasons on that side um, because there's a kind of inner tranquility or peace or something positive that comes from, you know, never being settled to anything. Um, and I think that, that is uh, not a, a good philosophy, not a good way to live life. And it amounts to universal agnosticism, right? And the attempt to maintain it. 
Uh, we have a bunch of super chats. First of all, thanks for everybody who did that. We'll just uh, run through these. So Mary Elaine has uh, a, a man in a dating site suggested I change my profile from atheist to agnostic so I'd get more responses. Uh, nope, that's dishonest. That is, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm i waiting for to hear in the follow-up on whether you uh, accepted the date, but I assume not. So Scott has, does a theist or agnostic deserve more respect i mean i don't my own views you can't answer just from those two categories it's it's very much why does the person put themselves in that category um i don't yeah and what do they mean by it like someone might mean might call himself an agnostic because he heard some argument like the one i heard when i was you know 10 or whatever and said yeah okay fine i'll call myself an agnostic but what i mean by it is you know I don't think there's a God. I don't claim to prove there isn't one, but I don't, you know, I basically treat it like elves and gremlins and goblins. And if someone thinks that, um, I think you maybe can argue with them about whether agnostic is a good name for their position, whether they're somehow undermining themselves by calling it that, but they are effectively an atheist and they're an atheist who's not, you know, well self-identifying. And uh, so, and, but then if you're talking about someone who's actually an agnostic versus actually a theist, who deserves more respect? Well, I think it's, I don't think there's really much difference in the end. It's an issue of what version of this view they hold and how much they hold it. It's the same if we go back to the religionists or skeptics, which I gather was the debate from a, a couple of weeks ago, whenever it was. If views are wrong enough, if they're really wrong, they're essentially wrong, um, as mysticism and skepticism are, I don't think there's really in the end an issue of which one is worse. They're all the way anti-life. They're all the way destructive. They tend to be two sides of the same coin and enable one another. So if you're thinking about what are the consequences of one, well, whatever the bad consequences of each are will also be the consequence of the other because they're going to cause the other, either in the same person or in other people around them. And these kinds of uh, false alternatives are self-reinforcing you know, systems over time, I think. Uh, and the, the real issue isn't which side of the false alternative does the person stand on, but how committed, how consistent are they? Are there better elements within them that are consistent, that are, you know, um, uh, that go against the worst ones? And uh, and you can often find that, like, if someone's a theist, you ask, well, why? What is it? What is it they, you know, that that um, God means to them? How do they understand God? Um, what do they think God wants of them or so forth? And is this a kind of mystical and supernaturalist way in which they're misconceptualizing genuine values? and things that are really important to them and things that they really love about the world? Or is it a nothing to which they want to sacrifice their lives and all of existence? And consistently held, God is the latter. But most people don't hold them consistent. And likewise, if someone's a skeptic or an agnostic or whatever, is it that there's someone who wants to never be too sure of something, who wants to undermine clarity and certainty, who wants there to be no knowledge, who's... uh, see someone who's competent in something and that sets them off and they want to tear them down or is it someone who um appreciates you know arguments and self-critical thinking and associates that with science and really loves science and misconceptualizes what science is doing in too paparian a manner or something like that that is after the Karl Popper the philosopher and uh, thinks well all you do is falsify hypotheses and so forth and um that's you know uh someone who has real values that they're misconceptualizing and misidentifying um, under this wrong rubric, which makes the pursuit of those values worse, can corrupt the values, but still they're largely about these values versus someone whose aim in life is to tear down certainty. You know. Well, it just reminds me of, uh, I was reading um, a biography of Kant last year, and there's a story about one of his very um, religious friends coming and saying, how can you say all this nice stuff about, this is before he'd, this is early in his career before he'd written the critique or anything, but how can you be so pro-reason? You should be like uh, uh, Hume. He went and showed reason is useless. 
And so like they were th these very religious people loved Hume because he was saying that this whole enlightenment obsession, thinking you could reach knowledge and throw away religion was wrong. And so you just saw like the, the union in the, the same mind of a, a person of, yeah, we don't have any problem with skeptics. These darn people who are pro reason and think they don't need religion. That is the real sort of enemy. And I, I and in my mind, I just kept hearing Kant, you know, saying you, you ain't seen nothing yet, but, um, yeah, Hume uh, was actually thought of himself as a Pyrrhonist, incidentally. So, um, oh, that's interesting. Skeptic. So that's um, he saw himself as reviving that school, and I think rightly so. Uh, so Allison says, uh, and thank you again, everybody who's sending in super chats. The people fear the unknown and feel believing in something that may not exist brings them a strange comfort. That's the rational thought process. Michael Sanders says uh, wrong answers are better than no answers, but right answers are better than wrong answers. Religion is better than nihilism and skepticism. Wrong answers are, well, I don't think that that's, uh, I, I think, I think I get the uh, intention, but um, I think it's a lot better not to know that you don't have an answer than to have a wrong answer in most cases. Um, also some, I, things that people hold as ideals are rationalizations for nihilism. And um, some wrong answers are um, excuses for rejecting right answers rather than independent. So if, if the idea is someone who's really trying to know and they care about getting the truth, but they've got it wrong, it's better than someone who doesn't want to know and reject the truth and so forth. Uh, or rejects, you know, trying to tell the truth. Yeah, that's true. But if someone is a religionist, if someone is a Marxist, which is a an, an answer, right? They have an answer. They think they understand how history works and so forth. Uh, if someone is a, you know, um, fascist, uh, if someone, whatever it is, is that like an honest attempt at getting at the truth and they're, they're wrong and it's better than nothing? Um, I don't think so. It could be for some people, some of the time. But it also could be and the, the means by which they're wiping out existence, the thing that they've come up with as an idol to sacrifice. And um, it, the, one of the things I find in Atlas Shrugged is that, you know, if you think about the way Rand discusses or Galt discusses God in his speech, right? It's, um, a definition that doesn't really mean anything. It's just an attempt to wipe things out. It's just something that's erected as an altar on which to sacrifice. And there's a way of holding religion, supernaturalism. I think in its purest form, it ends up amounting to that. It's just a, a um, more stable way of, of holding what amounts to a kind of nihilistic type of motivation, but of dressing it up for oneself. And in a situation where that's what someone's doing, that's not worse than nothing. It's a form of nothing, maybe even a worse or more virulent form. But that's not what everyone's doing who believes the false idea, even who believes an idea that can't withstand strict rational scrutiny. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up. That actually jumped out at me the last time I read reread Galt's speech. Um, was the 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 kind of um, deep nihilism because if you think religion is often positioned as this is the alternative to nihilism and if you think particularly like in the 19th century when you had dostoevsky and nietzsche and all these people wrestling with the you know the death of god and that kind of question what are we doing when religions uh kind of losing its grip on the human mind that was this idea that well it's religion or nihilism and i think that's getting that gets echoed i mean jordan peterson is very famous for kind of bringing that back into the debate certainly religious people have always um you know tried to position things that way um it's one of the criticisms of atheism that it's kind of a nihilism but if you read galt's speech it's really that these are just variants of being anti-reason and if somebody's really all in on being anti-reason. It doesn't matter if they have this kind of fantasy of, well, look, there's this other world and we're going to be rewarded. And um, I'm, I'm crusading for a supposed moral ideal um, that in practice, it's about tearing down reason and undermining reason. Uh, and I, and, and um, 
And well, the ideal might just be for that sake, right? It might have no, like if you think about Lily and Reardon telling Reardon there's this higher thing to which more sophisticated people sacrifice. Well, what is it? Well, it's not plumbing pipes and metal. Okay, well then what? Well, it's not this, it's not that. It's not anything. Uh, and which amounts to it's nothing where Jim Taggart has, you know, well, my true self, you know, I want to be loved for what I really am for my deep self, not for anything I do or am or any features I have or anything I've accomplished or anything I've said, or right? so for nothing, right? And um, mystical concepts taken, to, you know, fully and seriously uh, are nothings, and they're nothings on behalf of which we're asked to sacrifice everything. And that doesn't mean that that's what's going on psychologically in you know any particular person who says they believe in God and thinks of God as a kind of nice father figure who wants them to you know get a good job and uh, uh, you know um, dress well or whatever you know some combination of, of uh, maybe rational and secondhand values but it is um, you know I think at the core of uh, of religion and what makes it destructive and I think generally when you have false, ideas, the kind of pitting them against each other and thinking, you know, which is worse is not usually um, productive. There's not always an answer to it. Often there isn't. And um, it's often their forms of the same problem. And then different particular schools of thought, particular thinkers, particular social movements, particular people will have the common problem that these two alleged antipodes have in different degrees. So, um, uh, you know, a regular church on Sunday type um, might be a lot better um, than a burn it all down, um, you know, uh, uh, black block protest mob type who's an atheist, but then a, you know, um, generally skeptical person who isn't all about burning things down might be very similar in functionally into what kind of person he is to the church on Sunday, uh, Christian. So you just can't, you, the, it's the wrong level of resolution to look, try to make these judgments, which of these two ideologies is worse there. What's essentially wrong with them is the same. And then if you're judging a particular person, institution, group, uh, it's to what extent are they for reason and values and to what extent are they against them? Well, and that's, uh, I agree with all that. And I think, you know, it, it often comes up in the context of we're trying to decide who is worse because it's like a, it's strategically important in order to fight, you know, to uh, fight for a better world. But what it usually means is to fight against some bastards I don't like. And what usually gets dropped out is a focus on the positive. So when I think about like, which is worse, religion or skepticism, um, to me, it's more like, my major problem is that we're not pro reason enough. How do I get people to appreciate reason? And the, um, and it, it, it's a secondary question then about alliances and things like that. But those alliances can only exist in so far as there's an agreement on the value of reason. But if the agreement is just, Hey, religious people are bad or Hey, you know, skeptics are bad that's not a, an agreement. Like that's not a foundation for me to work with anybody. It can only be in some positive value. And, uh, and, and I think that's kind of what gets dropped out in those discussions very quickly. Yeah. And saying this kind of thing is not saying don't make decisions, right? Be agnostic on which is better or worse. No, recognize that at a certain level of abstraction, these things are the same. And then the decisions you have to make then are more uh, concrete decisions, which we can give you abstract principles for dealing with. So you might have to decide who do I vote for in this election. You might have to decide, uh, or or no one, right? You might have to decide what school do I send my kid to, the public school or this religious school down the street or this kind of non-religious private school that's too into certain social justice causes or whatever it is, right? You're choosing between these concretes, and in that case, you have to choose which is worse or which is better. But you don't have to choose is religion better than skepticism, is mysticism better than skepticism. It's, is this school better than that one? And the way to choose it is not to focus on the evils, but on the positives. That is, which of these schools does more to, incul to, to, to convey knowledge uh, and um, uh, give someone the tools to think for themselves? And it could well be either the more religious school or the more um, 
or the more skeptical or secular school. It's to do what is their curriculum? What are they actually teaching? Are they really teaching people uh, solid fundamentals of method and history and science? And there's a little bit of propaganda smattered on top where if they get the other things, they'll be able to eventually see through that. Or is the whole thing propaganda, in which case it's not good if it's propaganda for your side or the other side, because propaganda is not education? Or is it they don't teach anything, they just have the kids in a room and, you know, waste their time and their brains right away? You know, I mean, what is this school actually doing? What services are providing? And likewise, for, you know, any other issue, you think like, what, what difference is there between these things? And what positives are there that these, any of these promote or don't? Uh Robert ha uh, has, thank you again for uh, the super chat says, I don't know elevated to a religion, zero stars, not recommended. Excellent discussion, gentlemen. Thank you. Well, thank you. And finally from Anthony, we have, uh, what are your thoughts on the reimagined Battlestar Galactica series? It had a lot of very good philosophic questions in it. Um, I saw, I, I saw, I think uh, the f first few episodes a long, long time ago. I assume that this is, the one that came out like in the 2000s, if there's been a re re reboot, um, I don't really watch a lot of science fiction, but if Greg has any thoughts, I've never seen any version of any Battlestar Galactica. So I don't have any opinions on it. I tend um, with the exception of mysteries, not to like genre fiction, like I'll like one thing in a genre and then I'll resent other things for being kind of like, like it, you know? So like, I liked Lord of the Rings when I grew up and now like, I don't want to see some elf with elves and I got to learn different elf rules, write your own, you know, make believe. Um, and so like, I, I ended up liking Harry Potter, but it took me uh, a lot of convincing to, to even read those because, um, you know, with some other magic thing I've seen witches elsewhere. And there are one or two um, sci-fi, you know, programs or books that I like. But in general, that's something sci-fi is not a, a sell for me. It's a kind of mild, and, and I've already learned about Star Trek and Star Wars. What do I need some other, you know, future tech thing for? Uh, so I'm not inclined to watch sci-fi shows, but um, there are a few I've liked. Um, yeah, I, did. I, I, I have exactly the same attitude. Um, the only format kind of thing that I like though, I like that something's in this genre makes me want to um, read it or, or watch it is kind of cozy mysteries. I like, you know, there's an eccentric detective and he has a problem to solve and so forth. Uh, so those I, I watch pretty much all. Uh, yeah, I respect that. I like very gritty crime novels. So, <laughs> um, all right. Well, this has been a lot of fun, Greg. So uh, we have upcoming today at 7 p.m. UK time, 2 p.m. Eastern Integrating Investor with Seth. At 8 p.m. slash 3 Eastern, we have James Valiant discussing Leonard Peikoff's Maybe You're Wrong. And at 10 p.m. UK time, 5 Eastern, we have the return of TV talk on The Boys. I don't know what that means, but I'm sure uh, the rest of you do. But it all sounds really exciting. Um, Greg, thanks. Anywhere that people should go to learn more? about um, what you're yeah, up to you go to salemcenter.org you can sign up for the newsletter of the center that i'm part of and uh, a lot of the events i'm planning around um austin will all show up there the next uh, public one is a debate between um iran brook and Yazam hazani uh, on december 8th uh, on individualism versus conservatism so i'm excited about that and um most of the other stuff we're doing is just teaching classes and a little behind the scenes right now well, as long as it's not individualism versus uh, conservatism, which is worse, I think uh, it should be really good. Uh, it's supposed to be, which is better. <laughs> that, that's I, I like that. And uh, for me, everybody can follow me at donswriting.com and be sure to get the, if you do like uh, gritty crime novels, um, get I Am Justice, my new novel that is out as of, uh, what's today? Uh, as of Wednesday. So it's been... 48 hours and, and i appreciate everybody who's oh, actually, bought it so far i do have another plug now that we're plugging books and i say i've read um just the preface to i am justice and found it intriguing and look forward to reading reading the rest um even though i'm not generally a gritty uh gritty crime drama guy um the uh companion to ayn rand uh is now out in paperback and oh, awesome! That seem to actually be like there at Amazon now. 
I haven't seen a paperback copy in person yet, but they allegedly exist. Uh, Amazon tells me I could get one by Sunday if I were to order it now. So um, for people who've been looking for a more affordable version of the companion, it's for paperback, uh, $45. You can now get the Kindle again for 37. Uh, I think it's a really good book. And um, uh, if you want to dig deep into, into Ayn Rand and want to guide to her, uh, her corpus. So and it's the thing I'm proudest of that I've uh, been involved in. So um, for anyone who's uh, been waiting to buy that book till it's out in paperback, the day is here. Yeah, no, I, that is, I highly recommend it. I probably consulted at least once a week, sometimes more depending on a project. I think it's just um, filled with a lot of great insight. And if you're interested in the topic we talked today, um, there's two lectures by Robert Mayhew on atheism and Ayn Rand. One I think is already online. One was at this year's Ocon that I think uh, give a lo- were both really fantastic and give a, um, it brings out, I think, what's very distinctive about the objectivist take on religion that uh, you won't find anywhere else. So hopefully people will look those up. Yeah, I know we're trying to sign off, but let me give two last thoughts connected to recommendation. A uh, one connected to, to Don's uh, recommendation of, of Robert's stuff. One reason why people might be uncomfortable with the label atheist and therefore use agnostic or look around for something else, right? is the kind of cowardice that we've talked about before. But another is people who bill themselves as atheists. Um, Atheism isn't a philosophy. It's not something to be about. It's not a way to live. It's just saying you're not religious. And then the question is, well, then what are you? And um, there have been movements, groups of people who have tried to be about atheism, that we're not just saying religion is wrong and we're each going to offer our other alternatives to it. and so far as you think of atheism as just about rejecting things, then you think, well, I want something other than that. And um, you might, if you analyze the issue better or think it through a little more, you say, okay, I'm an atheist and this is what I'm for. But if you're thinking of atheism as the alternative thing to do what religion does, to give you kind of guidance in life, then you might um, think that it's... Um, it's a mistake and be looking for another title. And some of the better people in the atheist movement, um, people like Julia Sweeney, for example, um, but even people like Sam Harris um, and uh, uh, are, are kind of sensitive to this and don't really love the term atheist because it's you know just a negative. And there's the question of, well, what are you positively? And, and that might lead some people to um, associate atheism with a particular kind of worldview as opposed to with just not holding the religious worldview. And uh, that might be what, you know, someone on a dating site is, is on about if they would prefer agnostic. Um, the other is, I think the Leonard Peikoff essay, Maybe You're Wrong, um, which I gather there's gonna be a session on with, with Jim Valiant later. That's one of my favorite essays of Dr. Because the one that I learned a ton from. And it's very connected to this issue because um, it's about the arbitrary and the need to reject the arbitrary. Uh, the role of the arbitrary in skepticism in particular is what that essay is about. But it's, uh, I think, a, a really brilliant essay. It's something I learned it from a lot of, it's the thing that um, answered for me fully this question about, well, what if you can't prove the negative? You know, do you still not know it? Um, so I think a really brilliant essay, one you can learn a lot from and, and kind of pairs with um, his essay in a way uh, from later on the uh, OJ verdict. Um, or I forget when he wrote each, but a philosopher looks at the OJ verdict. There are two kind of, the two places outside of Opar, of course, where he kind of treats the arbitrary um, in, in the most depth and in connection with particular cases and arguments. And I think that, um, you know, uh, those are both tremendously valuable. So, um, yeah, and I, I, that, I, the, that essay I know is uh, in the Objectives Forum. I, it might be online for people if uh, you don't have access to that book. Um, but I'm sure uh, James will at least give you a, a good summary. But Uh, Thanks again, Greg. Thanks again to all of our super chat and we will be back uh, on with the daily objective next week. And in the meantime, unless we do weekend ones, a total fail for me if we do, but otherwise we will be back next time and uh, we will have lots of good stuff coming up the rest of the day. Thanks again, Greg. Great to talk to you, Don. Great to hear from all of you super chat.